When we hear the word borders, and depending on your politics, perhaps the first image you may think may be of a fence, or do I dare say a wall. No discussion on borders would be complete without addressing this issue, so let's do just that. Today we have with us three of the nation's leading border experts to give us their take on this issue and to help lead them through this complex and divisive topic is AGS Counselor Ms. Andrea D'Amato. Andrea? Thank you, John. I just want to start by saying, hey, good afternoon. Great. Uh, everyone's familiar with the expression, good fences make good neighbors, right? Right? Is that true? Oftentimes, there's an unintended consequence of fences. Maybe they started out with a good idea, but don't always end up that way. I'll tell you a little story about my neighborhood, which is a very tight neighborhood in the city of Boston, which I'm from. And we had a neighbor who erected an 18-foot fence. What happened after that, what ensued very quickly, was an enormous amount of conflict on epic proportions and resulted in close neighbors actually not talking to each other anymore. So there are a lot of unintended consequences to some of the actions we make, and our panel will be talking about that today. From the beginning of time, it seems like a human imperative to draw lines in space and create places and territories. And they'd often do that by using walls and fences. Um, that's been the case forever. What has changed is the world has changed. The populations are a lot larger. There's a lot more conflicts emerging with larger populations. There's a lot of movement. So the magnitude of divisive divisions within our planet are getting higher and stronger. And what's happening as a result of that is we see emergence of actually new communities. We see identities forming along borders, along fences. And dare I say, we may see the emergence of new cultures. We have a panel before you today. I'm very excited to have the opportunity to moderate this panel. And they're going to actually be addressing some of these issues in three different geographic hotspots in the world. And without further ado, Dr. Alex Diener. Take it away. So. I have the magic hand. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me begin my talk, as I do all my public talks, by announcing at the outset that I stutter. I do this so that if it crops up, we don't have to pretend I'm not doing it. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is the idea of filtering mobility and the normative valuation of borders. Um, what we see here is that borders are elemental. I will argue that from a geographer's perspective, borders are elemental to, the, to placemaking. They are key uh, technologies for differentiating and delineating space for particular purposes or assigning meaning. We also see that they're multi-scalar, but often more, in, more encountered in their de jure form. But I would also argue that they are basic ideas of political and social geography, playing into many of the fundamental concepts that we, that we deal with a, a, as a profession every day. Privacy, private property, jurisdiction, sovereignty, civil beneficence, and some would even argue democracy. Now, Borders have long functioned as filters. Um, this, uh, and this often relates to the degree uh, of permeability sought by a particular group. Now this goes back, we can trace this to Plato arguing in the laws that Sparta was a model of the polity emphasizing security. Whereas Aristotle critiqued him and said that, that there needed to be engagement outside of that polity. So you see the idea of the border being either fixed and set and impermeable or far more open. U.S. migration history has, has its own notion of when and, and, and why we are, are open to two different peoples. Uh, surplus capital, surplus land, and a deficit of labor is one of the arguments that has been made that we, we, we invited people in. But we know that in doing this, there's always been an effort to differentiate between more and less desirable peoples. So borders good, borders bad. Uh, Charles Mayer, in a recent book called um, Once Within Borders, argued that the political spectrum is often considered to be an e effective approach to how people value borders and their per per permeability. But he also argues that it's not really the case. There are isolationists on the right and on the left. There are globalists on the left and on the right. You can see different examples here. So I turn to this idea then in within the scholarly de debate about are borders good, are borders bad. The border's bad group often emphasizes them as sites as violence, extortion, pejorative 
exclusion, mechanisms of, of accumulation and institutionalization of advantage. You see them as a mechanism of privilege for select parts of the world and something perpetuating global inequality. Now the Borders Good Group will counter this and say um, that borders are a mechanism of protection, mechanisms of anti-hegemony, defining realms of responsibility, defining the practical scope of civil beneficence. What would a world look like without borders? How does that work? And I think both sides certainly have some merit to their case. Uh, as we look at the scholarly debate further, I think it's terrifically important to acknowledge the banality of geographic evils, that there are inequalities within the global system, and that, there are the, and that place holds a certain power to affect human opportunity. So borders are, I would argue, a technology of social control, and this is very much part of a political and bureaucratic imperative to project that territorial con control. This also has a temporality and a social positionality, compelling us to always have to ask, for whom are these borders created, where, when, and to what effect? Now, my research takes place in, in Central Asia. I was drawn to this region because of the new states, the international borders, national borders, geoeconomics, and, pol and political dynamics emerging. And so much of this focuses on the control of trans-state mobility of varied sorts. Now, if we look at this, we see, as, as we heard earlier, about the recasting of great power in this region from Russia, India, China, the US. But the question then is, are these projects mutually compatible? Um, do, are, is there a, a material and discursive reorienting of the regional imaginary through these? And also, are, are these projects trigger, triggering local resistances? So, just to give a picture of this, we know that there are massive projects being enacted today to reconnect Asia, to create a bridge across this region once divided. Uh, the Asian Development Bank is doing it. The U.S. has its notions of the, of the, north and, uh, uh, the northern and southern distribution networks. China's Belt Road Project. The Eurasian Union has its own vision. The EU Silkwind has its vision. And a number of other countries have their ideas of how this, this region is to be integrated into their broader geoeconomic reality. Where, the his, where history seemed to portray this region as a fluid space with city-states and frontiers, I think we have to acknowledge today the significance of sovereignty and the bounded space that is state. So each one of these states has a say in this. The great powers may weigh in, have their vision, but each one of these states enacts a different political ideal that will affect the way they set their borders, the degree of permeability that they seek to foment. Where the history of Eurasia has always been a complex negotiation between the mobile and the immobile, it remains ever so more today, compelling us to ask who uses the borders, where, when, and to what effect. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Francisco Lara Valencia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to talk about the U.S.-Mexico border, um, and I decided to um, start with a question. Um, being there, being in a place like El Paso, Juarez, or Tijuana, San Diego, or Matabonos, Brownsville, you tend to think that your border, your border reality is unique. Uh, but if you are far from the border, from that border, you tend to put that reality into boxes that uh, are not, in my opinion, always well informed. So what I'm going to do today uh, as part of my presentation is to try to ask, uh, answer the question, uh, what the U.S.-Mexico border has in common with other borders, and what is singular to this border. And we can start with looking at the origin of the U.S.-Mexico border. We know that that border was initiated as a result of a war between Mexico and the U.S. that uh, ended in 1848 with the signage of the Guadalupe Hidalgo Treaty, and, um, and later was modified uh, through a purchase uh, of La Mesilla, as we call it in Mexico, in 1853. So that's the origin of the border. It's a border that uh, divided uh, rivers, that divided ecosystems, that divided, divided nations and peoples. Is what uh, geographers will call a support-imposed border because it cuts, it cuts cultures, nations, ecologies that existed in the region. And even though those, those, that fragmentation that caused by the border, uh, 
mobility and a change occur uh, despite of this, in spite of, in spite of this, this reality. So that's one thing that this border has in common with other borders. Normally borders are initiated as a result of, of conflict and work, and normally they tend to be uh, this uh, herida in el territorio, as Anzaldúa expressed in his writings, that really generate tension and conflicts over the time. That's one thing that has in common. The other thing that has in common is uh, the U.S.-Mexico border has gone through many cycles of uh, bordering and rebordering. Uh, if you think, for example, the beginning of the U.S. Border Patrol in 1924, it was the first time that uh, uh, movement, it was, uh, control of movement of people along the border was institutionalized and uh, formalized. There were some activity before that, but the creation of the Border Patrol in 1924 really initiated a process of bordering that extend over time. Uh, it kind of weakened uh, after uh, the Maquiladoras program in the 60s, 60s, after NAFTA, in the beginning of the 90s, but it was again uh, reinitiated with particular intensity in 1993, uh, in 1994 with Operación Guardián and other programs that were established by the U.S. Mexico, uh, but by the U.S. government to try to control the movement of people along the border. What is interesting about these two processes is that they can happen simultaneously. If you think, for example, in Operación Guardián, and or Operation Hold the Line in the San Diego area, they occur simultaneously when Mexico was entering into, and the U.S. were entering in a, in a period of uh, strong integration as a result of the uh, approval of the North American Free, Free Trade Agreement. So this is something that is also common uh, to uh, uh, the U.S.-Mexico, that the U.S.-Mexico border share with other borders. You can think in some other things. For example, you can think in the adjacency of differences, the fact that you have two different institutional systems, regular, regulatory systems. You have uh, uh, market uh, factors that are differential across the border and explain a lot of the interactions that happen in the region. The density of border materiality, 43 uh, border port of entry along the 2,000 miles of border is enough to uh, clearly see uh, the uh, physical expression of the border, plus the behaviors that the border impose on people. When I take my students from ASU to the border, they are amazed to see, for example, how well behaved is the people that is trying to cross from a place from Nogales, Sonora to Nogales, Arizona, waiting patiently in a line to be inspected, behaving uh, uh, very um, well because they know that they're going to confront the power of an authority that is right there on the border. So this materiality uh, of, of the border is clearly observed in any place along this region. And finally, I just want to mention something that I believe is important and has not been investigated enough, which is the border effect uh, distant decay. I mean, as you move from the border, you can see it in any border place uh, in the world. As you move from the border, the, the presence of the border kind of uh, decay in the area. Now, what is unique to, or singular? I don't want to say unique. What is singular to the U.S.-Mexico border? The fact that we have a very intense process of urbanization and metropolization. 85% uh, of the population along the U.S.-Mexico border live in metropolitan or uh, cities, uh, 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 formally speaking, which is higher than the average in Mexico, which is also higher than many that, that in the U.S. So the level of urbanization, metropolization, create very peculiar processes in the region, externalities, environmental externalities, synergies in, in the planning and management of many different, different problems. The deep asymmetry that exists between Mexico and the U.S. is another uh, aspect that I believe is singular to this region. It's not unique to the region. We, saw this, we see this difference in other places, but the fact that you can, for example, hire an uh, industrial worker to be employed in Maquiladora for $2.8 uh, uh, an hour, when the U.S. you had to pay $20, that create a huge incentive for this type of integration. Now, I'm going to finish my uh, participation with the other aspect that I believe is really important. 
the way we represent the border, the way that the border is represented to us is kind of problematic but, but for someone that lives and, uh, and investigates the region. So the, the four most important uh, challenge that we have in, in investigating and understanding that border is the reimagining of this, this space. I mean, the way that the border exists right now, the U.S.-Mexico border exists right now, is problematic. So we have to find the way to dig in that region in a, different, in a different manner. What can we do about that? We can start, for example, by recognizing the ancestral co connection that exists between the two sides of the border. I mean, you go and talk to the Tohono O'odham, you go and talk to the Cocopa or the Kumiai, and they will tell you of those connections. We have to recognize also the connection that exists through nature, rivers, ecosystems, and uh, species that, that live in the area. But also we have to be more practical and recognize that the border is a social space where people connect and develop networks and develop institutions and develop forms to address collectively the problem. The big challenge that we have in the region right now is exactly how can we reimagine the space using as a main tools of transformation, cooperation, and the idea of integration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Elizabeth Campbell is gonna bring us to the Middle East. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, right, so I'm the director of the UN agency responsible for Palestine refugees. The second, there's only two UN agencies and we have responsibility for those refugees living in Gaza, the West Bank, uh, Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan. And today I want to focus uh, my presentation on the concept of humanitarian access um, um, and the struggles that we uh, as UNRWA face and here focus specifically um, on the West Bank. Um, so humanitarian access is something that's codified in UN General Assembly uh, uh, resolutions and applies to all humanitarian action uh, globally. Um, and it's basically this idea that um, humanitarian access, it's a, a fundamental prerequisite to effective humanitarian action. It means that as humanitarian actors, as the UN, as international NGOs or other civilian actors, if we cannot physically access populations who need food, water, shelter, or other forms of basic assistance, um, we simply can't do, can't do our work. And all over the world, we face all kinds of access restrictions, whether they're bureaucratic, or related to an intensity of hostility, um, armed attack or attacks on humanitarian personnel, theft of assets, um, et cetera. Uh, so for example, it goes without saying where we operate in Syria, uh, armed conflict is a huge uh, um, uh, constraint on our ability to effectively provide assistance to, in this case, Palestinians who live there. Sometimes intens inten the intensity of hostilities in places like Gaza also makes it very difficult for us to do our work um, but in the case of, of the West Bank, which I want to talk about and focus on today, a lot of it has to do um, with um, all kinds of the ways in which sort of the West Bank is divided and fragmented into little bits, making it very difficult for us to access the refugees um, who live there. And before focusing that on that, I just wanted to sort of say one uh, word about Gaza, which is a place that um, we obviously also work on, but I just to make the point, I don't want to focus on it today due to lack of time. But um, as we talk about sort of borders and their impact and our ability to access populations, I think you probably all know it's a very small um, uh, part of the world where um, two million people live, over one million of which are refugees. Um, and since the full sort of um, Israeli military closure there, air, land, sea, just as an example of how it's impacted um, us from a humanitarian perspective, Prior to that period, about 80,000 refugees who lived there needed humanitarian assistance in the form of food, and today now that figure is over one million. So it's just an example of how uh, borders impact our work. Okay, so here what you're seeing uh, on this map is, I should have brought my glasses, but um, is basically what we call the Green Line, um, the only internationally recognized border um, uh, separating uh, the State of Israel uh, from um, the West Bank. Um, okay, so if we click on Palestinian communities, you can see now where the majority of um, the, the Palestinian communities reside. And then also we can see next where the majority of the, where the refugee camps are. Where it's all, where, and that also sort of shows uh, where most of UNRWA's operations are. 
uh, namely what we do is health, education, and humanitarian assistance. Our, the biggest part of our budget is basically running an education system across the Middle East for 535,000 uh, boys and girls. Um, okay, so um, that's more or less sort of what things looked like pre-1967, um, sort of one cohesive territorial unit, the West Bank, and then of course over the last 50 years, um, various policies, practices, and decisions have fragmented uh, the West Bank into dozens of disconnected um, bits. And so now we'll sort of walk through that very quickly. So if we start uh, with the Oslo peace process and um, areas A and B, areas A are under full Palestinian control. That's where they provide most of the services, including the security assistance. Uh, area B, it's, it's under joint um, Israeli-Palestinian control. Um, this is something that some of you may know was something that was intended as sort of a temporary uh, geographic uh, division or administrative division that was supposed to last about five years until the final status negotiations were completed. And this has sort of been the administrative uh, reality uh, more or less for almost the last now 20 years. Um, less than 40% of the total has been designated areas uh, A and B. Um, this means that about 60% of the total territory is now referred to as what we call Area C. Mm. Um, and this is where uh, the State of Israel remains in direct control of, of basically all aspects of life, law enforcement, security, access to resources, movement, um, etc. cetera. Um, um, okay, so in this area you have about 300,000 Palestinians who live there, including refugees who are under our responsibility to provide various services to. Um, and typically in that, so the blue area, Area C, uh, refugees don't have, um, or most Palestinians, including refugees, typically don't have um, proper infrastructure. They live in very basic shelters. It includes a lot of herders, Bedouin communities. Um, uh, poor access to roads um, and are obviously therefore quite uh, vulnerable. Okay, another, uh, moving now to the next one, we started looking a little bit at um, another cause of fragmentation, um, something that's been in the news lately, in fact, um, relate to um, um, settlements. So here, if we look sort of um, at the outer limits, we have, there's about 150, um, for a total of about 600,000 uh, people who live there, including around 200,000 around um, East uh, Jerusalem. So this sort of shows the outer limits of those existing uh, settlements. We can also look at um, the municipal um, areas of settlements, which includes, which is about three times bigger than the areas within the actual um, outer limits. Um, and much of the, these areas are closed military zones, and again, not areas where um, Palestinians or, or refugees um, could access. And then the next would be sort of what we call um, regional, the third layer. Um, that's areas or land that's um, uh, formally placed within settlements, local or, or regional councils, about 43% of, of the West Bank, and it sort of functions uh, like uh, a land reserve, but an area um, to which most uh, Palestinians do not um, have access. Um, and there are, of course, other uh, restrictions that make it difficult for us as a humanitarian uh, organization to access uh, the populations, but also for those populations um, to, to access our services, our schools and um, health clinics. Um, so you can look at closed military zones um, and also the nature reserves. Uh, many of these sort of uh, overlap. And then on top of that, we might as well, we'll just go right on and add um, um, the various closures. There is more than 700 movement obstacles, including more than 60 that are fully uh, staffed checkpoints, um, but also hundreds of unstaffed obstacles, uh, road gates, trenches, concrete blocks, earth mounds, um, uh, et cetera, that makes it very difficult to move, for us to move inside of the West Bank, but also for um, Palestinians to move um, around. And then finally, um, the barrier, which hopefully it's, you can see the, the red area. Um, and here I would just highlight that about 85% of that, I think you can see it, um, is, is inside the West Bank, so not on the original uh, 67 green line that we showed at the beginning of the slide. So, this map is really just to um, 
give a picture of the fragmentation, but also the difficulty that um, you know, we face in, in um, effectively providing our mandate, which can result obviously in um, all kinds of humanitarian implications, but it also it's, it's a very costly way of, of doing business. Great, thank you. <clears throat> we have two mics, so if you'd like to line up to ask questions, we have a little over 10 minutes. I'm just gonna kick it off by asking the panelists while everyone's lining up to ask questions. Um, in the work that you are undertaking right now, are you finding that you're missing any, any data that would help us better understand um, uh, the needs and therefore the interventions that have to happen to address some of the impacts on the communities that are being impacted by these borders and fences? Are you missing data or you do have enough data? Yeah. In Central Asia, one of the challenges that one often finds is that research in borderlands requires to do it well, often requires you to do research on either side of that border. And the political regime on the other side of the border, one may be open, one may be closed. And that, that often gives you that one, that one view. And I think if we can get more people trained up, and now, you know, this is border research. It often requires in-depth language, in-depth historical knowledge, cultural knowledge. I think we're, um, we're really, it, it is absolutely Im imperative that we get on both sides of those borders so that we can understand the borderline and the interactions. In, in the case of the, the U.S.-Mexico border, there has been some improvements after the signers of NAFTA, the U.S., Mexico, and Canada agree, for example, in a, a standard, uh, the North American Industrial Classification System, and other protocols to generate comparable information across the border. So that facilitated the, the work. But uh, there is still some areas with, where there is uh, some uh, holes, vacuums, for example. The information about movement of people is only uh, generated by the U.S. Mexico doesn't have statistics about people coming into, into Mexico. I mean, the reason is obvious. Mexico is not so concerned about controlling uh, who crosses the border as the U.S. is. But uh, sometimes uh, you find a little bit complicated to do analysis using that, using that information. Um, and uh, also, I think that uh, we know that, for example, on the Mexican side, not all people has the ability to cross the border. Uh, the allocation of visas and passports is pretty much uh, associated with your income and your ability to show that you have a steady job, for example. Uh, but there is no statistics about how many people uh, uh, live in, the, in, in Mexico, work in the U.S., or vice versa. How many people that uh, is U.S. citizen live in Mexico uh, because uh, housing is, is, is cheaper, things like that. So there is this type of information that we really need to find ways to uh, generate somehow. I think the biggest challenge that we face is that we were set up in 1949 as a temporary agency that was meant to dissolve um, upon the, um, uh, the uh, conclusion of a political um, uh, solution to the conflict. And that obviously has not been the case. And so, of course, we over time have collected a lot of data, but we were not set up to collect data. And it's not a static situation, right? I mentioned, for example, the situation in Syria where prior to the, the Civil War, about 6,000 Palestinians relied on us for humanitarian assistance, and now today that, that figure stands at 100%. So we have, you know, it's a very volatile situation. Um, circumstances are changing all of the time, but in many ways, our mandate, what we were, were asked to do in 1949, hasn't fundamentally changed. So I think it, it makes it very difficult for us to be more rigorous in our data collection because we're not funded and staffed to do that. And in all those cases, without the data, you can't tell the story. And without telling the story, you can't bring light to the situation. Thank you. Please identify yourself. Hi, my name is Jody Asaley. I'm from Dallas, Texas, and I'm a, a AP Human Geography teacher. My question is for Dr. Campbell. Um, one's real simple, and one's maybe, how do we access those amazing interactive maps that you have? <laughs> um, and that is, I've not seen that, and I've done a lot of research on the Middle East. And then the second part is, can you talk about what you do with education um, in the West Bank? So on the maps, um, I, I will certainly let the organizers of the conference know if it's something that we can share. But it was something that's been developed in-house by the UN um, 
uh, it's called UNOCHA, it's responsible for humanitarian coordination. Um, and then the second question is about education and what we do in education. Sure, so um, among the areas where we focus, I noted um, one of the, the biggest area that what requires our, the majority of our expenditures is indeed on education. So we teach uh, refugee children in those five areas I mentioned from grade one, basically through grade nine. There's a couple of classes of, of grade 10. Um, and I have to say that I think it's one of the uh, services about which we are most proud. There's very strong data that shows um, how uh, effective um, our outcomes are. So for example, there was a World Bank study in 2016 that concluded um, our children are outperforming their national counterparts in public school by one year of learning. Um, um, again, um, I think that there are many reasons for this. One, um, we are able to continually adopt um, our curriculum and infuse it with what we call UN values, but um, it's sometimes also modern pedagogy, so we're able to um, um, look, you know, sort of enrich it in ways that um, other comparable systems um, are not. We have a very um, strong um, human rights um, curriculum that is mainstream throughout all that we do. Um, and also, I want to mention that um, because everything we do is infused with UN values, uh, the majority of our employees are women. And in every school where we teach, 50% of the students uh, are girls. That is not this, the case, I think, in the, the, for the rest of the you know, comparable um, public schools. Wow. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Frank Prouch from Lossy Tech Partners. Um, the government of Hungary placed a 325-mile fence up on the Croatian and Serbian border uh, during the Serbian crisis from 2015. In 2017, it went into effect, and it has stopped about 99% of the population flow other than the controlled population that are trying to move across those borders. Yet you never hear anything about an uh, international outcry about Hungary putting up a wall or a fence or whatever you want to call it. So where is the ethical boundary on when you put up a fence for your own sovereignty and your own security and when is it not? I see a massive dichotomy worldwide with regard to implementations of walls and fences based on politics and based on uh, social norms? It's a great question. And I think uh, this is like the heart of the presentation I tried to give is that this becomes this relative thing to the interests and desires of particular groups. To the extent to which an international body weighs in and says that's a, that's a good border. This is, I think, something that needs to be researched even further um, because in a sense, as, as I showed, if you have the left and the right, they're going to have their own views as, as to why that border should be more permeable or more or or less. And I think this is this is cer certainly something that I'm that I'm looking at. I think a lot of other people in the room. Thank you. Hi, my name is Elizabeth. Uh, I teach AP Human Geography at the Escola Americana de Belo Horizonte. Um, I guess this is kind of a question for Dr. Campbell, but it's also a question for Dr. Laura Valencia as well. When you talk about the temporary structures, uh, the kind of temporary status almost of um, the Palestine and West Bank, um, both at the U.S.-Mexico border and with Palestine and Israel, how do you deal with refugee camps or with detention centers or processes that were never intended to really be as massive as they currently are or as long-standing? What do you see as the realities on the ground for what that's going to look like in the future? <clears throat> so, um, right, as I said, um, when Palestinians fled, um, they moved into tents, which um, everyone expected was truly a temporary situation that would be imminently resolved. So over time, what happens, those tents became concrete houses, those concrete houses became overcrowded sort of areas, and now we call them camps, but if you were to go there, you wouldn't be able that word doesn't really accurately describe anymore. So, you know, I, I think, I mean, Palestinians are the largest and longest standing refugee population in the world. And so, I mean, on the upside, we have a lot of good lessons learned to share with other refugee situations globally about how you manage uh, 
to try to provide people a certain level of human development, which requires stability in, frankly, states, or at least everywhere else in the world, basically, um, absent a, a political solution, right? And so I, I don't know that there's a recipe or a way or an approach, but um, what does make the work that we do very unique and I think extremely uh, effective is that our focus on education because there is no political solution for these civilian refugees, um, but they take that education and they do extraordinary things um, with it to the extent that they're, they're able. And that's, sorry, and that's unique. I mean, most, in most refugee situations, you do not see that level of education services. And I think that you can say the same for the US-Mexico <laughs> border. I mean, uh, when uh, the Central Americans and people from Haiti start coming into places like Tijuana and Nogales just recently, uh, the reaction of the local uh, communities, NGOs, churches, even local governments or the private sector is we need to deal with this. Uh, is, I mean, uh, for us the border is not a political uh, reality, it's more like a daily life reality. Uh, one of the things I observe, for example, in places like Nogales, Sonora, with the arrival of Central Americans, the caravans, uh, uh, months ago, is that uh, the groups that were attending immigrants in the area had to modify the, the way they work. And, and in the sense that, for example, they had to extend the period that refugees or the immigrants can stay in the places they offer. They start networking with the private sector, developing new mechanisms uh, of collaboration with government, and also working a lot with uh, groups on the other side of the border. So there is this flexibility and this adaptation that is kind of imposed by the hardness of the, of the border. The border is continuously changing and imposing mm -hmm. new challenges to the communities that they are able to, uh, to, to respond. Definitely there is a sort of a crisis in, uh, in some of these communities because the, the changes that we observed recent years, I mean the mixing of the flow you have people being deported. Uh, you have people coming back from the U.S. into Mexico because the options are limited in the U.S. But also you have people uh, running away from violence in southern Mexico, Guerrero, Oaxaca, and also the people from South America. And then you have the families. So the mixture that you see there is really, really challenging. But I can say that uh, the things that we have observed in, in the border is there is this uh, flexibility and this capacity to respond somehow. So we have about 30 seconds for each of you left. Could you please comment on how geographers can influence public policy to better mitigate the impacts on populations that are stuck at borders and walls? You know, one uh, kind of a passion project of mine, particularly relating to geography and the training of future geographers, is the desperate need that we have for, the, for language training and for uh, field work monies to enable masters and PhD students to get abroad and do the research to become the, the, the experts. We have to have another gen, generation that is, that is really trained to do that kind of work. We need to bring geography into other disciplines. I mean, we need to bring geography into sociology, history, political sciences. We need to bring geography to other uh, areas out of the classroom. When I show maps like the when you're presenting into public meetings, the response of people is really interesting. They really engage with uh, the information and the knowledge, and also seeing things as you show to us in the map, also prompt action uh, for, from people. Um, right, I, <clears throat> I don't know, I, I really agree with my, my colleagues. I think, you know, I, for me personally, the interdisciplinary approach is, is really the way to go, and I guess the only other thing I would say is that um, we have to always remember in all of the work that we're doing from any angle or perch, um, I would say um, to the unit of analysis should increasingly be through the civilian eyes um, because you end up with completely different research questions and completely different conclusions. Perfect. Please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you.